right, without further ado, let me quickly introduce our first speaker today, Bjarte Boxnes. I hope I got his name right. Um, Bjarte has been one of the um, initiators, let's call it this way, of uh, the Beyond Budgeting Initiative or movement. He has worked almost four decades in, uh, in the industry, uh, starting out, I think, with uh, Borealis, and then later they became part of Equinor. You can correct me on that, Bjarte. And he has built a lot of experience, not in theory, but in real practice, on how you can build budgets or something equivalent to them in a different way. And that different way is in many cases much more coherent, much more compatible to agile ways of working in organizations. But the link between beyond budgeting and agile, either Bjarte will cover this in his pre presentation, or I'm sure we will then later talk about this once we get started in our Q&A. So Bjarte, I'm handing over to you. It's your stage, very much looking forward to hearing from you and very thankful that you're donating your time to us. Thank you. And um, let, my, let me share my screen here. Um, I hope you can see this one. Yep, it works. So beyond budgeting, it's business agility in practice. Uh, beyond budgeting is actually about much more than budgets, as, as you will find out uh, in case you, you didn't know. Um, and um, uh, just for the, the, the um, just as you know, my, my first management job back in, in Statoil, as we were called then in the early 80s, that was head of the corporate budget department. So I've been heading up more budget processes in my life than I want to be reminded about, but I know what I'm talking about. And um, also, even if I'm a finance guy, I've also worked in human resources, heading up uh, the HR function in this company, Borealis, where we had a chance to kick out the budget already in 1995. And that was a big wake up call for me when it comes to the people side of beyond budgeting. Every time I discuss beyond budgeting with people, there is one word that keeps coming up, and that is the word control. And the context is, of course, the fear of losing control. Um, and when I ask people, what do you mean with control? After people have said cost control, many go quiet. They actually struggle with defining putting words on what they are so afraid of losing, which is quite interesting. Um, if we go to Oxford Dictionary, they call it the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what does this mean in organizational terms, business terms? Well, that basically means controlling people and controlling the future. And behind these two lies the two main assumptions that underpins almost everything in traditional management. Number one, you can't trust people. Number two, the future is predictable and planable. And we are challenging both those assumptions in Beyond Budgeting because these are nothing but illusions of control. For instance, that people can and must be managed. Well, of course you can manage people, but if people are managed in stupid ways, they hopefully find their way around in order to get their work done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing that we know is that we don't know. Wise people have agreed with what I've just have said. When it comes to people, good old Peter Drucker, most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. And when it comes to um, corporate planning, another wise uh, guy, Russell Aikoff, he compared a lot of the planning he was observing in, in large companies uh, with a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And I understand what he means because, again, I have done a lot of dancing in my life uh, uh, through these budget processes. I'm not really sure it actually helped on the performance of the company. Okay, so much for wise people. Imagine an organization that a hundred years ago invented a fantastic machine, state of the art and key for the success of this organization. 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble and today this machine is completely broken. Copied. You will probably understand that this is not the true story because in real life, people would have gotten together 
50 years ago and done something here. Either try to fix the machine or even better, try to invent a new machine. Because innovation is something we all love. Innovation is great. We all want to be leading edge, unique, right there in the forefront, better than everybody else. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology innovation into products and services. But there is also something called management innovation that we are talking about today. And management innovation, that doesn't seem to be equally great. That is scary. Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? The consequence is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side. Everybody is into that kind of um, innovation in some form or shape. The management innovation arena is not yet the crowded place because it is scary. But that is actually good news for brave companies who dare to explore, embrace also this kind of innovation because you can get just as much performance, competitive advantage out of management innovation as you can from technology uh, innovation. And there are companies out there who openly admit that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we produce and what we sell. We find it in the way we lead and manage. And I've got a few examples for you in a, in a minute. This performance world is important. That is the reason we should go beyond budgeting because it, it is good for performance defined in the right way. And I want to reflect a little bit on that uh, word in a slightly different setting than, than business and organizations, because some of you know that I like to use traffic as a metaphor. Because in traffic, when we are out driving, we would also like to um, uh, experience good performance, a, a safe and good flow. And uh, oops, uh, before that, one slide, by the way, um, it is called since it's called beyond budgeting, it has, of course, something to do with budgets. And before I, I, I take that metaphor, I want to share with you my budget problem list. I'm doing that to show that the problems here are actually more serious than what we often think. Uh, it's a very time consuming process, making budgets, following up budgets, assumptions quickly outdated. Um, this is a serious problem. It stimulates unethical behaviors, the lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, the resource hoarding, the internal negotiations, all the things that we don't want to experience in our organizations. It creates illusions of control, as we just talked about. And if you don't have control, um, whatever that means, it is better to, to, to acknowledge that and act accordingly, not to think that you have control and act accordingly. Budgeting forces us to make decisions too early. We have to decide in the autumn the year before what we shall do and what it shall cost. And in um, many organizations, too many of these decisions are taken too high up. It doesn't always improve the quality of those decisions. Very often, it's the other way around. Budgets can prevent us from doing things that we uh, should have done, but we can't because it's not in the budget. But this also works the other way around. It can actually lead us to do things that we maybe shouldn't have done, but it is in the budget and it is spend it or lose it. And linked to this, I acknowledge that the budget, a cost budget, can be a very effective ceiling for cost, but it is just effective as a floor in the sense that these budgets tend to be spent for the reasons we just discussed. And to define good performance as hitting the budget numbers is a very narrow, mechanical, and sometimes a completely outdated language for describing good performance. We need a richer, broader performance language. I have been sharing this list of problems with hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the 25 years I've been working with Beyond Budgeting. And uh, most people actually agree, executives, managers, even finance people. At the same time, most organizations uh, continue doing this stuff, which is quite interesting. And I'll come back to why in a minute. Uh, I just want to add on one more problem that actually not that many people have on their list. I've called it conflicting purposes. And uh, this, the interesting thing with this problem is that it is both a problem and the solution. And behind this lies the fact that companies use budgets for three different things, to set targets, financial targets, sales targets, um, uh, and so on. At the same time, this budget should be a forecast of what next year can look like. And 
it is also a resource allocation process, handing out bags of money to the organization. And it might seem very efficient to solve all three in one process and one set of numbers, but that's also the problem. Because what happens if we move into a budget process, we want to understand next year's cash flow, and we start, we ask people on the um, uh, responsible for revenues, what's your best number for next year? But everybody knows that the number I'm sending upstairs will come back to me as a target for next year, maybe with a bonus attached. And um, if you ask the same in other people for the best costs or investment numbers, everybody knows that this is my only shot at getting access to resources for next year. And um, uh, some might also remember that 20% cut of last year. And that memory and that insight might also do something to the level of numbers submitted. And this is a problem, not just because it destroys the quality of numbers, but also because it stimulates this, at least borderline unethical behavior, even if I don't want to blame people because people respond to the system that we have asked them, that we have set up for them. So this is not about fixing people, it's about fixing the system um, that will change the behavior. And this, the solution here is we can still do all these three things, but we shall do these three things in three separate processes uh, because these are different things. A target is an aspiration, a forecast is an expectation, and resource allocation is about optimizing scarce resources. And once we've separated, we can start to improve each one. Um, that was the closest to budgets and finance I will get in this uh, session. Um, I think one reason why so many continue doing this stuff is that these um, problems are regarded more as irritating itches and not symptoms of a bigger and more systemic problem. But that is exactly what they are, symptoms of a huge problem, which is also a paradox. Because here we have a process invented roughly 100 years ago. It's pretty old management technology we are talking about. And in case you don't know, the inventor was Mr. James O. McKinsey. And I never met Mr. McKinsey, but I don't think he was an evil man. I think he had the best of intentions. He wanted to help organizations perform better. And I'm sure this worked 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, but no longer today, because today, as we will come back to, things have changed. But we are back to this important word, uh, performance. And as I said, I like to use traffic as a metaphor. And these are two typical uh, or the, the two normal ways of, um, of uh, managing traffic when there is crossing traffic. And if you think about the traffic light, the one who makes decisions here is the one who programmed that, this light. Uh, and that person would not be in the situation when you sit there waiting for that green light. And the information that this program would be based on would not be entirely fresh information. Um, uh, it is a model where uh, uh, you are not trusted, and it's a model where transparency is not important. As long as you can see the color of the light, um, th that's it, that is uh, enough. And it is also a model where values is not important. If there is a mindset of me first, I don't care about the rest, that is not a big problem in front of that light. Whereas in the roundabout, me first, I don't care about the, the rest, is a big problem because here we are much more dependent on everybody sharing a positive um, purpose or wish of wanting this to fall well. We have to interact with each other. We have to help each other uh, in a very different way than what we need to do in front of that light. And of course, here we make decisions and the information we use is fresh, real-time information. So uh, the roundabout is about managing performance. The, no, sorry, the traffic light is about managing performance. The roundabout is about something else. This is about creating conditions for great performance to take place. It's about enabling performance instead of managing performance. And this is more than playing with words. These are two fundamentally different ways of addressing that, that big question. How do you get the best possible performance in organizations? The roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. And self-regulation is another important word here. And organizations today need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. One reason uh, is our business environment with all the VUCA out there, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity. And with that high level of VUCA, it, that must have implications for how we design our management models compared to if there was little or no VUCA out there. 
The other reality we need to reflect on is internal has to do with people, asking ourselves what kind of people do we generally believe that we have in the organization. And um, uh, we use um, Douglas McGregor's theory X and theory Y as, as, as a label for that discussion. Um, so do you believe that people, theory X, that people are a bunch of potential thieves and crooks that all must be uh, kind of kept in, in short leeches or mi micromanaged? If not, they will all run away and do a lot of stupid things. Or do you believe that people actually want to do a good job, want to be involved, want to be listened to, want to be treated as adults? And again, your belief here must have and will have consequences for how you design your management model. And if we combine the two, it could look like this. You recognize the two dimensions and traditional management lies in this lower left hand corner. And if we want to get out of that, we need to address both dimensions, both leadership horizontally and our management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of traditional management, very rigid, detailed, annual, rules-based, micromanagement, centralized command and control, a lot of secrecy and a strong belief in sticks and carrots as ways to drive performance. What we need to do here to get out of it is on the leadership side, more purpose-based, more values-based, more autonomy, more transparency, not just as a learning mechanism, but also as a subtle control mechanism. There are companies, and I'll come back to an example, that have transparency as their only control mechanism. Um, and last but not least, internal or intrinsic motivation as opposed to external or extrinsic motivation. And um, of course, the most common uh, uh, mechanism in, in, in business today for motivating people externally is uh, individual bonuses. And I can think of no area where there's a bigger gap between what research is telling us and what business is practicing. It is simply amazing. Many organizations, they have the best of intentions on the people side in what they say and what they write, but it doesn't help to have these theory Y leadership visions if we have theory X management processes. And that is the case in a lot of organizations. And that creates poisonous gaps between what we preach and what we practice. So what we need to do in the management process dimension is to change these processes to better reflect our uh, people view, which is hopefully than, than, than theory why, while at the same time making our management processes more VUCA robust. And that, and this is where you're coming to the budget, because the budget, you typically need to do something with the traditional detailed annual budget, because it represents so much of what we find in that lower left hand corner. More specifically, when we shall set targets and goals to the extent we shall do that, um, we recommend some inspiration from football. I have yet to meet a football team saying that the ambition for next season is to score 39 goals and get 42 points. Those are budget goals and they don't think like that. It's all about league tables and doing well against peers and competition. And in many instances, that kind of thinking can make sense in, in, in uh, business as well. We also need more dynamics into these processes. Why shouldn't everything circulate around the fiscal year or typically January to December? So where is possible, we need more business-driven, more event-driven rhythms. And last but not least, we cannot reduce performance evaluation to comparing two numbers and then conclude. Again, we need a richer, broader performance language. And this, my friends, was a crash course in beyond budgeting. This is what it is about, addressing both leadership and management processes in a coherent, consistent way in order to become more adaptive and more human. Uh, and beyond budgeting, again, as you can see, it is about business uh, agility. A number of companies are on this journey today in some form or shape. And I could have talked for hours here, fascinating stories about uh, uh, brave companies uh, exploring management innovation. We don't have the time. So two quick examples. Let's start in Norway. In the upper right hand corner, you see a company called Miles. It's an IT company, business in Norway, the Baltics, South Africa and India. Miles have no budgets, no targets. If you work for Miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, um, as replace it as open as you want, as expensive as you want, no PC budgets. You can attend whatever conference and seminar you want, as often as you want, wherever in the world, no training budgets, no travel budgets. But it's not an anarchy. They have a very simple control mechanism, 
when you have bought that PC, when you have returned from that training, you need to post on the internet what you did and the cost of it. So transparency is their only control mechanism. And they have no problems whatsoever with cost. The second company I want to talk about here is very much the pioneer within Beyond Budgeting. It's a bank, you see them at the, in the middle here at the top, a Swedish bank called Handelsbanken that has around 700 branches in Northern Europe, quite big in the UK. Handelsbanken has no budgets, no targets, no individual bonus, and they have been operating like this since 1970. So we have a nice long period to look back at to see, does this stuff work? Is it good for performance? And the performance track here is simply amazing. This bank has been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. This is among the most cost-effective universal banks in Europe, and the bank has never needed any bailout from the authorities because they messed it up. Very different management model from most other banks. A lot of um, autonomy, a lot of transparency, um, a lot of, um, uh, they use a lot of league tables to compare branches, mainly to stimulate learning, but also as a kind of gentle performance push because nobody likes to be uh, laggards. Handelsbanken and some other companies, including Borealis that we talked about, inspired what became known as beyond budgeting in the late 90s. So the, these principles were actually formulated three years before the Agile Manifesto. Uh, at the time, there was no contact at whatsoever between those two communities. Uh, that has fortunately changed, which this uh, session is an example of. And, but you can see that there are many similarities um, between the two. The, I think the big difference is that the Agile Manifesto was not developed in as a way to run a big organization. It was initially developed uh, to improve software development. Uh, Beyond Budgeting was born in order to help organizations um, uh, or improve the way organizations are, are run. So there are things that beyond budgeting addresses that Agile actually uh, misses, but they complement each other very well. A few reflections uh, on this slide before I'm going to um, finish my presentation here. Uh, as you can see, we are addressing both leadership and management processes for the reasons I just uh, talked about. Uh, I don't think what we say on the leadership side necessarily is that unique because many other communities have a similar view, but very often these, these uh, movements haven't reflected very much about what kind of management processes you need to activate these leadership principles. And likewise, there are some other good management models out there, but they haven't re reflected very much on what kind of leadership must underpin this. We are looking at both and coherence between the two is key here. A classical example of the opposite, it doesn't help that we talk loud and warm uh, on the left hand side about how fantastic people we have on board and we would be nothing without you and we trust you so much. But not that much. Of course, we need detailed travel budgets. Are you crazy? Hypocrisy is what I call it, right? Poisonous gaps. There has to be a coherence. Also, these are principles. This is not a management recipe. What this should mean in an organization depends on that organization's business, culture, values, history. That's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. The only thing you have to do is to read the books, hire the consultants, tick the boxes. I find that both boring and dangerous. Here you have to think for yourself. Last uh, point here, uh, two classical misunderstandings around beyond budgeting, both linked to principle 10. Some people think it's just another way of managing cost. Well, it is, but there are 11 other principles. This is quite um, a, quite a comprehensive um, uh, management and leadership uh, model. Second misunderstanding, uh, no budgets. Uh, I can spend whatever I want. Cost is not important. Sorry, that's not what we are, what we are saying. Cost is still important, together with other things in order to create value, and often it will be a constraint. What we are offering are more intelligent, effective ways of optimizing within that constraint compared to what Mr. McKinsey could offer us uh, 100 years ago. 
So that is what I wanted to share with you. Um, if you want to explore further here, these are my contact uh, uh, details. Um, I uh, uh, took early retirement from, from uh, Equinor uh, just actually a few weeks ago and have set up Boxness Advisory. So check out the website if you're interested and also check out the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. And um, I'm also quite active on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I only tweet about this stuff. There's no cats and dogs and grandchildren, I promise. Uh, what you've heard here was the very, very short version. If you want to hear a longer version, it looked like this. Um, this book has uh, more about the problems with traditional management, more about the model and, and cases here, um, including the Borealis and Statoil case. There's a chapter about beyond budgeting and agile because of all the similarities. And obviously more about the implementation, uh, which I have not been able to, to cover here. Maybe we can come back to that in the Q&A. So with um, on that note, I'm gonna stop my sharing and I look forward to questions and uh, discussions. Thank you. Perfect. Bjarte, thank you. Thank you for giving us this uh, wonderful crash course. It was like, really, really fast. I was like, what? There was a crash course in Beyond Budgeting. And, uh, but uh, very insightful. Thank you also. Um, as mentioned earlier, some of you joined while Bjarte was giving his presentation. The presentation will be shared, so you will also get his contact details and can connect with him afterwards. But now let's use the remainder of our time. We have around 22 minutes for uh, Q&A. And I'll kick this off. I wrote down a few questions. And for all of you uh, listening to this, feel free to put your questions into the chat. And I will make sure that within the time that we have, I address as many of those as possible. But um, let's start with, um, with something that came to my mind. You talked about um, many different types of innovation and management innovation being, for many organizations, the one key differentiator. Gary Hammond is another famous person that talks about this a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. He actually has his, uh, his ladder of innovation, basically, or innovation mm -hmm. stack and management innovation being the one with the highest impact. And you already gave um, a few examples around management innovation connected to the topic of budgeting. For example, taking away like traveling budgets, but replacing them with policies with regards to transparency, et cetera. So there is some kind of responsibility and control. So it's not anarchy. Do you have other examples that you can share with us? I'm sure you do, where you can also like, which are easy to implement because the one that you already mentioned is quite easy to implement. It doesn't take a lot to do it. Do you have a few more that you can share with us? Yeah, if we're now on, on the cost side, uh, on um, managing cost, then I can give you a few examples from Equinor. Um, uh, one alternative that the company use is um, a burn rate guiding. So there's no budgets, but there might still be a number in, uh, in the range of uh, a million, 10 million, 100 million. Uh, as a guiding so that you are not completely in the dark about what kind of activity level you shall operate at until something else is decided. Within that burn rate guiding, you have full autonomy to, 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 uh, to make the right decisions. Uh, uh, so that's one alternative. Um, if, if it's an operating producing unit, you can use, uh, for instance, unit production cost targets. You can spend more if you produce more. You can have benchmark unit production cost targets. And if you have internal units who are true profit centers who kind of fully control their own cost and income side if they have some kind of bottom line target they cannot run away and spend money like drunken sailors but it might be okay to spend more um, of what we call good cost because good cost is not the problem as long as we have the financial capacity we want more good cost because they create value it's the bad cost we want to get rid of yeah that's the stuff we want to cut out mm. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, someone is already uh, uh, okay. Um, now the second point you you talked about and immediately it it, it it enlightened something in me was the difference between targets being aspirations mm. and forecasts being expectations. Mm. And I immediately had to think about all of these organizations that I supported in the past as a management consultant, creating strategies, etc. But even today, when I work with them on changing their organizational setup, management processes, et cetera, they, 
now this is my perspective and I want to be challenged by you on this one. They, can, they don't make that distinction between aspiration and expectation. The aspiration becomes the expectation. And do you, first question, do you see that as well? And two, how do you make sure that people actually distinguish between those things? Because I think it's fine to have high aspirations, yeah, yeah. also fine to have high expectations, but the expectations need to be realistic. The, the aspirations can be, at least in the short term, unrealistic. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Before I answer that one, I want to add on one thing I forgot on your previous question about uh, managing cost, um, uh, because it, it's uh, the example I will give has some similarities with continuous delivery in Agile. Uh, Equinor has no traditional uh, detailed investment budget where you sit in the autumn and decide everything. We shall invest exactly this much and then split exactly on these projects. And then you hand out these bags of money as next year's project uh, or investment money. Uh, instead, uh, there is a, a, a process based on the concept that the bank is always open. So the line can always forward a, a, a proposal for a project, yes or no depends on two things. How good is your project? And do we have the capacity as things look today? So this is continuous delivery, not of software functionality, but of decisions and financial resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so again, uh, uh, yeah, dynamic resource allocation, we call it. But back to your questions. Um, I mean, the, the, I mean the, these are uh, different things. Um, and when it comes to that expectation, that should be brutally honest, Ex the expected outcome, whether we like what we see or not. And we are using that information to help us to get to where we want to go, namely the target, to the extent we shall have targets. We, if, if there's time, we can take that discussion also afterwards. But if, if you have targets, then, then you need a, a forecast you can trust to see um, kind of where, where you are uh, uh, heading. And the way to make this happen is again to set up formal, formal processes, uh, a, a process where you we establish targets, preferably that people set their own targets, um, and the forecasting process um, where you get people to understand that this is just a forecast. Those numbers, it's not a bid into a target negotiation, it's not an application for resources because we've got different processes for that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the beauty with starting <clears throat> beyond budgeting here is that this is pure logic that that the three purposes and the separation is something CFOs understand and it's mm -hmm. not scary but once you are separated and you then and you move into improvement mode how can we set better targets how can we improve the forecasting process improve resource allocation you are moving into these bigger um, uh, discussions around beyond budgeting what real targets I think what really motivates people uh, resource allocation do we need detailed travel budgets if we say we trust people and so on and so on so it's a nice um, uh, not scary way of getting started and I've helped around 30 of the companies on that list to get started and uh, with the majority of them this is where we started out the separation okay. of the purposes yeah. Okay, I, I will get back to that where, where we started out because I have a whole round of questions around when to start and what to start with. But before I do that, you talked about the things that motivate people. And uh, one of our participants um, is asking about bonuses, right? Mm -hmm. In many organizations, that's the number one way that organizations try to motivate people. And we know this science doesn't back this up, that this would work. Yeah. Now, can you please tell us more about how that works in, in the beyond budgeting philosophy. Let's put it this way. Yeah, uh, we have uh, our principle 12 of the 12 principles is about rewards. And uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, advocate common bonus schemes driven by, uh, so everybody on board and, and, and for instance, driven by how the company is doing versus other companies. So the, the Equinor bonus uh, is, uh, is organized like that. And we stole that idea from uh, Handelsbanken, the Swedish bank. So that is, uh, and, and, and then, you know, that is not meant to be a kind of do this and get that motivation thing, right? It's more, yeah. it, it, it motivates, but it's, it's more a kind of com a common clap on the, on the shoulder of everybody after the fact. It's not a dangling carrot. 
And also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm dead against individual bonuses. I've been in that scheme for many years. Of course, I enjoy the money. But if somebody thinks that is what motivated me, they, they have, hadn't done their homework. Um, and, and I would actually call it individual bonus. It's managerial laziness. Yeah. Because it is much easier than to take the leadership role of working with mastery, purpose, autonomy, and belonging, and all the other things that we know are so much more effective. So um, I think that's one reason why it is still so so popular. Yeah, I, I think I, I, yeah, I can definitely back that up. Individual bonuses being managerial laziness, yeah. especially when you tie those individual bonuses to specific uh, numbers yeah. that a person yeah. needs yeah. to hit. Yes. And, and I see that happening with also boards of directors who yeah. have to ultimately decide on the CEO pay and bonus yeah. Yeah. that they that are, they are so afraid of having that difficult conversation, mm. which requires them to really understand what the organization has been working on and what the CEO has been doing with their team. And because of that, they try to they spend so much time in just finding out, finding out some arbitrary numbers based on which they want to like yeah. evaluate the person's work. Yeah. All right. So uh, I, I could also add on here that Equinor still has some individual bonuses, but, but what, what the company has is what we call a holistic performance evaluation. And that means two things. First of all, um, the most important principle in the company is that um, uh, how you deliver is as important as what you deliver. And with how you deliver, we talk about the values in the company and the weighting between the two in all consequences for your career and pay is 50-50. The other part of holistic is that when you shall assess what is delivered in business terms, it's not just a question of looking at measurements through numbers. Um, it is that can be a starting point, but you need, you go, need to go behind the numbers, behind the measurement, and look at th things that measurement did not pick up. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I see that your KPI is green, but have you really moved towards those uh, strategic objectives? Uh, how ambitious were your targets? Should we punish somebody that stretched themselves and didn't make it, and do the opposite with somebody who lowballed and gamed and made it? Has there been? significant changes in assumptions, headwind, tailwind that we should take into account. So this qualified discussion, the assessment, um, in addition to, 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 to measurement, is, uh, is um, also something we recommend in Beyond Budgeting. Um, again, we call it the holistic performance evaluation. Yeah. And I think that's one of the important areas where managers are still needed in an organization, but they need to focus their time on completely different things than they're probably focusing their time on right now. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I'm going to steal this quote, individual bonuses are based on managerial laziness. So thank you for that. Now, there are a few questions in the chat around the topic of change in an organization, mm -hmm. right? And you have seen this, I've seen this, I think many of the participants have seen this. Many organizations are on their journey or on their agile transformation or whatever we want to call this. And I don't want to even go into the debate whether transformation is a good term or not. But it's at not. some point, at some point, right, the topic of finance, controlling, budgeting, all of this comes up because organizations ultimately realize it's not about having a few teams work differently. It's about implementing a new what I call operating system in our organization. And budgets are a key component of that. Now, at what point on an organization's journey would you approach the topic of budgets? Where would you do that? Like on which level? And how would you do that? First of all, I will kind of extend this beyond budgets. Is this the command? A budget is just a way of, of exercising command and control, right? Yes. But, but yes. There, there are many, and many other ways you can do it as well. So, so it is the command and control thing, including budgeting, you have to address. And uh, today, we are very often called in uh, to help organizations on these transformation journeys because they all realize at one point in time, and often late, that they, we will never succeed without also addressing the stuff that we are talking about. And again, as I was touching upon, I mean, we are, we are filling some holes uh, in Agile when it comes to scaling Agile into how to run an organization. And um, uh, it's better to be called in late than not to be called in at all. But the yeah. best thing is to address these things upfront. 
And one reason for addressing it upfront is, is that the, the message, the change message is so powerful because this is a process that basically everybody hates. And if corporate is telling that we are going to address this, attack it, change it for the better, that is a strong signal that change is for real. Just as the opposite of not doing anything is a very strong signal that this change is not for real. So uh, I would recommend to do it upfront, but uh, better late than never. Yeah. Now, and I would assume, and I might be wrong here, that addressing this topic requires at least CFO involvement, right? At one point, yes. Uh, but uh, I mean, we have examples where the, the finance function has convinced the CFO, which yes. then has convinced the CEO. Um, we have actual examples where, where HR has been kind of uh, just as strong in, in, uh, in this as, as finance. And uh, uh, we strongly recommend actually finance and HR to work together on this for the reasons I just talked about this being just as much about leadership as, as management processes. Mm -hmm. Now, when you get into these conversations with um, leaders in the org, maybe even the CFO, but no matter whom, I believe that a lot of the things that you covered today will really um, challenge their, let's say, comfort zone. Mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? Well, it's, uh, I have to admit that I kind of, um, I, I, I always kind of assess or try to assess the, the team or the, the executive I'm going to address because if you kind of, some, if you actually are completely turned off by starting out like this, and in that case, I'm, I'm starting with that budget separation discussion which is not scary, pure logic, right? And then you can take the bigger stuff afterwards. But again, the big majority, it's, they simply haven't reflected on this. They've kind of, as with those problems, they have sensed the irritating issues, but they have never realized that this is a systemic uh, and, and big uh, problem. So we are helping them with, with, with understanding that. And um, of course, um, uh, many also, do this because they've always done it and everybody else is doing it, but that is changing now. So another thing that helps us is there are so many companies on this journey now, and in some cases, competitors are on that journey, and that typically tend to make companies interested. So it's much easier today to get executive attention than, than it was uh, 25 years ago um, for, for many reasons. Um, uh, Agile is one reason. Uh, the pandemic uh, was another reason. The pandemic is interesting because we've had many other crises earlier, but those earlier crises typically ch only challenged that that second assumption I talked about that th that the future is uh, is predictable and planable. But the pandemic also challenged the first one that you can't trust people because all the homework and home offices have forced people to trust their employees whether they wanted it or not and we all know that in most cases it had worked wonderful so um, there are some positive things coming out of that pandemic yeah, absolutely absolutely that's it i think we still can't wait till this, this, this is over <laughs> no 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 um you, you um I, I lost my thoughts for a moment no you were saying um those uh uh, I lost it for a moment. No, no problem. So I would just ask one of the questions uh, a participant has put in the chat for me, okay. which is um, the correlation between beyond budgeting versus rolling forecasting uh, as a process. Is, the, is this the similar thing? Is this different? What similarities are there if, if they are similar? Well, rolling forecasting is how you is one way of organizing the forecasting process once you have separated the, these three processes, right? So there is a target setting process, there's a forecasting process and a resource allocation process. And that forecasting process can either be rolling, uh, meaning that you update your forecast typically every quarter and typically most look five quarters ahead continuously. Um, at Equinor, we did what we call dynamic forecasting, which has no predefined frequency and time horizon. So units simply update their forecast when stuff happens. 
um, that they that they think justify forecast updates, uh, and it goes into a common database. So at corporate level, we can at any time tap into uh, the latest numbers when we have a need for it at corporate level. So rolling rolling forecasting is just a, one of the practices in um, in uh, uh, and, yeah, and one of the, the principles uh, also addressing forecasting. Mm -hmm. Now my uh, thought came back, and I wanted to ask you. You have worked in many different industries, at least based on the slide that we saw. Do you see differences in those industries in their willingness to apply these techniques and make this huge shift from, from my perspective based on the products and services those organizations build? Not necessarily between businesses, but more between cultures. Okay, um, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and of course uh, there are there are cultures where this is more challenging than than in other cultures. That, that's not a secret, and I often get that question. Um, and I my response is always that well, culture can be an issue, a challenge, but it, it should never be a showstopper. Um, and also, I think we sometimes make these culture differences sometimes bigger than what they often are. I mean, there are some amazing. Um, beyond budgeting cases in, in South America, in China, um, Japan, uh, as, as, as some examples. Um, but not, I mean, if you think about those different uh, industries or businesses, the, the fascinating thing is how similar the problems are when it comes to budgets. That budget problem list kind of is relevant, independent of what kind of business you're in. Um, so this is a very, uh, generic uh, problem that, that everybody recognizes. Yeah, well, I can imagine. So the problems are similar. Their willingness to change and adapt yes. is, uh, again, different based on the yeah. different cultures they have, but yeah. we have examples everywhere. Now, yeah. let me close with um, one question that is always important to me. It's about culture. And if I remember correctly, you mentioned that there needs to be a coherence between the strategy, mission, board, whatever, culture of the organization and, and then the th things that they do. Now, what I have seen in, in my years working with organizations, and it's not as many as yours yet, but um, is that culture is something that is based, that, that is created, or that is the result of the things that we do. Mm. Right. Yes. And the policies that we have, the structures mm. that we have, the metrics that we use to, yes. yeah. to measure success. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And when I look at beyond budgeting and the principles you talked about, the activities you can do, the practices in there, I think many of them can result in a huge culture shift mm. in an organization. So do you have that conversation with the CEOs, CFOs as well, and ask them, whether they actually want that culture shift. Absolutely. I mean, it's all, I mean, we, we, because sometimes we are called in because somebody wanted to fix a, a budget problem, right? Exactly. And, and again, then, then what you're saying is that th this is not, it's about much more than budgets. This is about how to run an organization. And you need to, uh, you need to be clear about what kind of problems you're trying to fix. And fortunately, more and more have bigger and bigger aspirations. They realize uh, we are working with a huge French company right now, and they realize that they have a uh, uh, a culture of, of uh, internal negotiations and lowballing and gaming and sandbagging and all the things that they want to get away from. And we are trying to help them to understand that while well, the that is a result of the system that they have uh, set up. And, you know, process drive culture. So I, I, I very much agree with you that you, you can work and change cultures by doing important things on the on the process side. Yeah. Cool. Could I say one more thing before we leave? Yes, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, what I've been talking about today, I mean, it will happen. I don't, I don't care if it's going to be called beyond budgeting or business agility or whatever. I couldn't care less, but it will happen. And in 15, 20 years time, when we look back at what was mainstream management in 2021, I think we will smile, even have a laugh. Just like we today smile about the days before the internet or the smartphone. And how long is that? And as organizations, we can choose to be vanguards, early movers, and get the competitive advantage by doing this now. Or we can choose to be dragged into this as one of the last ones. I think that is a very simple choice. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Bjarte. And I think this is a wonderful final sentence and note to everyone participating here. Thank you very much to everyone. We will share Bjarte's presentation. This session was recorded, will also be shared with you. Um, read his book, connect with him if you want support on that, and Bjarte hosts some workshops.